Okay, I apologize. I, I had a slide before this. I'm only doing a sub portion. I'm doing the I'm doing the teaser for Brian. Set him up. But uh, but this is uh, we we we've come up with some fancy names for our our uh, hardware hacking sub group presentations lately. So this one's Whirlpool, Maelstroms, and uh, and main hacks. So running out of the good name. So uh, before I start, uh, thanks. Uh, We've got Kevin Gleason coming, shooting us for uh, cable access uh, tonight. We, as, as always, we have uh, John Abreu shooting us for the DLU archives, so, uh, so you'll be able to watch this uh, 10 years from now and see how we've embarrassed ourselves with predicting what the future is going to be 10 years from now. Um, that's a pretty good track record for the work. That's, that's true. Yeah. So, so my. My subsection is going to be about a very high visibility portion of what's going on in the embedded business. Very high visibility gets a lot of media coverage, but only represents something like one percent of the business, and that's the high performance embedded computing. Uh, Brian calls it high performance energy efficient computing. Uh, we've got a couple of domain names that, that uh, were available. HPEC.com is where we put a lot of our videos. Where Brian puts a lot of the videos we shoot. So, so I'll reference some of those at the end. And I wanted to, because we were making vague references to whirlpools, I had a picture of the Niagara Whirlpool. And uh, to the right of the screen here, oh, to, to your left of the screen, that's the Nikola Tesla dynamos at, um, at uh, Niagara Falls. So on, in the pantheon of gods at MIT, Nikola Tesla is up in the top three or so. You can go up to uh, Barker Library and get your picture with a statue. So we only have statues of a couple of guys, but I'm, I'm going to reference four of the five of the major gods at MIT in this presentation. So but Tesla's way up there. He's so, Tesla's so big that everybody's naming uh, you know, companies and, and sub-products of, uh, of their companies after him. There's, there's the electric car company called Tesla. Uh, last generation NVIDIA GPUs are Tesla. They've, they've gravitated to Kepler. Now Kepler's also a very popular name for, you know, for hardware. There's a, there's a Texas Instrument product line also called and it's kind of in the same space as NVIDIA, Kepler. So, so let me be the, the last to tell you, uh, or possibly the first to, to reiterate, that the good old days of Beowulf clustering are back. And the reason they're back is because, yes, yes. so, and, and, and we, are, we are now the, um, the blue Beowulf clustering subgroup, uh, blue bus, no, debug. Debug is now the oldest of the, Beowulf clustering groups and user groups on the eastern seaboard. Because uh, for those of you who have seen uh, Don Becker come here and talk, um, he had a group, he used to be based out of Annapolis, Maryland, um, <coughs> had his own distro, skilled uh, Linux. Uh, he and a couple other guys ran, was it was a VW bug, Virginia Washington Beowulf users group? So that, that was the oldest of the of the Beowulf user groups on the Eastern Seaboard, we were the second oldest. But hey, he wrote the book. He literally wrote the book. Tom Strong and two other authors wrote the book in '99. It has since been re reissued. Mm -hmm. So now you can get two versions: one with Beowulf cluster computing with Linux, and the other Beowulf cluster computing with Windows. And uh, you can go to Amazon and see which one sells better. <laughs> so, uh, we might have I, an advantage there. Yeah, so, you notice I'm not speaking at the uh, Boston Windows Users Group tonight. So, um, so uh, this is a substantial rewrite of the original. Uh, they, they discovered very early on when they were working at NASA uh, that the message passing interface would allow you to do really large matrix uh, this was this was their app that they needed to figure out how to do, and uh, you know you can look. This is these are um, scatter plot or graphs of, of the distribution of computers through the ages on the top 500 list. So so if you were into supercomputing a decade ago, and certainly before, you know vector machines were, were the, uh, uh, ruled the ruled the, uh, the planet back then, and the uh, this light blue area is your commodity cluster uh, solutions that, it, that started in earnest oh, about the time that, that Beowulf clustering became all the rage. And so uh, it looked like this was going to go on in perpetuity. 
we get a couple of roadblocks that I'll talk about really briefly. Like I say, I'm not, I'm not going to do my standard big old clustering uh, lecture tonight. I want to basically show why we've transitioned to the, to the technologies that Brian's going to talk about. But I will have a, a very good update for you before the year is out. Um, probably before November, there's going to be a couple of really nice product announcements come out, and uh, I'll tell you about those. Um, so the three things that are keeping <coughs> us from progressing into exascale computing in the CIS world, in the, uh, uh, what does the C and CIS stand for? So what? Complex instruction set computing, yep. and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and why risk, reduced instruction set is going to be the way of the future in, in data center and supercomputing mm -hmm. is because of both the power wall, the memory wall, and the ILP wall, the instruction level parallelism wall. So uh, I'll show a couple of places where you can avoid those completely with RISC architectures. And you bump into them in the CISC architectures. So in recent years, we've fixed things, you know, these new programming languages like CUDA. Uh, you used to have to do a, 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 an add and a multiply separately. Well, now you've got to multiply add as, as, a, as an instruction in CUDA and some of these new languages that, that, are, that are geared towards uh, uh, parallel programming. Um, I'll tear through this too. I just wanted to show you, because this is next to a river, and it fits in well with my last slide. Um, they just recently <coughs> commissioned Roadrunner. So the story with Roadrunner was, it was really, really something else for its time. It was built around the, uh, the, the cell broadband engine. Now they got theirs from IBM. The IBM 2S 22s was where uh, Los, Al Los Alamos National Labs got their cell broadband engines. But a lot of that IBM code um, ran on your PlayStation, PlayStation 3. So the Air Force built a 3300 node PlayStation cluster that, that also that ran. It was, it was a very close to being the same uh, Cell broadband engine that was in, uh, I think it was STI, uh, Sony, Toshiba, and IBM were joint ventured on the CBE and uh, ran like gangbusters. Certainly ran the thing the Air Force wanted it to, to run, which is some synthetic aperture radar. And uh, uh, so they recently decommissioned all of those. It was very hard to keep Linux on your Sony PlayStation for a while because they plugged it into an internet connection. You'd wake up in the morning and Linux would be gone. So from about 2006 to, to when they decommissioned Linux on the PlayStation. So, and that's, that's for another slide too, because it uh, turns out people have been keeping Linux alive on the PlayStation. So even though you can't get it from Sony, you can't get a Linux distro, and you can't get, you can't even get a cell broadband engine anymore, there's still this, this large community of people running Linux on their PlayStation clusters. So that'll, I'll talk about that in the future too. So just real quickly, um, the November list of the top 500 supercomputers in the world had a little bit of turnover. It, it normally is, is, uh, is dominated by IBM BlueGene, especially BlueGene Q. So keep an eye on BlueGene Q. They, they do some very interesting things. We can ask some of our IBM folks in here. Very interesting things about keeping memory close to, to CPU core and, and bypassing the, the von Neumann bottleneck, which is plague of, of a lot of other system architectures. Uh, this definitely informs some of the some of the embedded designs that we'll talk about. Recently, some of these um, uh, some of these Xeon Phi boxes. There's one Xeon Phi with a combination of uh, the NVIDIA uh, either K10, the all single precision G GPU, or the K20, which has uh, <coughs> has a lot of double precision on it. Not as much as single precision, but, but uh, the K10s came out, I think, six months before the K20s. So a lot of people were, were back trying to run their codes in single precision and then trying to see if they could migrate their code over to a, a double, double precision architecture. So the green500.org, both of these are .orgs if you want to check in on any of the uh, details. Green500.org has a couple lists. If you if you have a competitive uh, energy efficient architecture that you think needs to be listed um, at the Green 500, you can submit it. They've got, they've got some rules, pretty lenient, uh, and a fill out box. You can send it in. They have deadlines to make the June conference and the November conference. But you'll see that a lot of our familiar faces on this one. We've got some, some Xeon Phi, 
some NVIDIA K20, there's your, your uh, K20s, and lots of blue gene. So blue gene has, has uh, I'll show you that on the next slide. Blue gene gets from the green. So blue gene has owned the green 500 since it came out. It's 2.5 gigaflops per watt, or, or almost between 2 and 2.5 gigaflops per watt will get you at the top of the green 500 list. Wow. And if you big it, build it big enough, it'll get you pretty close to the top of the top 500 list. Top 500. So, now there's other 500 lists, list of 500 computers based upon a benchmark that they call it the graph 500 list. A lot of people, a lot of architectures, and a lot of production systems prefer that list because it's more demonstrative of what, what, what workloads people run in the real world. These are very synthetic codes that get you on. The Linpack is, uh, almost everybody agrees that it's not a good way to compare computers, but it's, it's the uh, incumbent, it, it's very entrenched. So, so Linpack is how we, how we differentiate between computers on these two systems. So I've gotten a lot of these slides from, um, if you go to eehpc.com, there's a bunch of presentations from a workshop that was at, at last supercomputing. And the guy that runs the Green 500, Wu Fang, said I could use some of his presentation slides. And for our, for our uh, proof of concept system, I, I got a bunch of slides from the guy that, that's running the uh, Mont Blanc project. So we're gonna transition into discussions of that architecture. So you'll notice, this is, this is why Blue Gene was such a game changer. I'll, I'll be showing you a lot of log log graphs here. You can prove anything with a log log. <laughs> so this is what I'm gonna prove. So there's a bit, bit of a cone going in this direction back when the Japanese skate computer ran, ran the, uh, uh, was at the top of the top 500. So it wasn't looking good for us to get to an exit flop. The K computer is in the low ones or twos petaflops. Um, so this trajectory is looking a lot better. So going to uh, an exit flop cluster in uh, uh, probably 2017 or something, 2018, to 20 megawatt cluster. So, and that's if we learn the lessons from Blue Gene. And so um, we can ask Blue and some other IBM folks what other lessons. The, the uh, embedded memory controller is, is the one that, that ARM took to heart. But this is the slide I like best. Because if you extrapolate from, if we follow the K computer curve, and we don't want to do that, we follow the Blue Gene curve. If we were to build this today, or uh, 2010, we get to an exit flop or pretty close to it for 500 megawatts. But if we build it out here in like 2014 or 2016, we'll actually be generating electricity because <laughs> it'll fall below, <laughs> the, uh, fall below <laughs> the system. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> These are good times to be alive. But. So just really quickly, I want to show you some of the progress of that. So if you run a search engine, you can generate electricity for your house. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> So a, a couple of us from Debug, Kevin and I went down to Supercomputing 2002 and we built a, a micro cluster out of uh, Athlons, which was kind of a, it was a, a low power Athlon back then. Um, the folks from Sandia preferred, so some of their architectures, they built, I think this Linux lunchbox was Socris, and I think maybe the Linux wagon was, was Geode. So this was, um, those are separate architectures. Or they were back then. So AMD bought the Geo brand. Does that still exist, the Geo brand? I don't know. We still sell them. Oh, I don't yeah. know if we still make a, a lot of new designs. I don't think there are new designs based on Geo, but the yep. existing ones yep. are sold. So Chris was famous for the uh, for the, the Carnegie Mellon Farm, the fundamental array of Wimpy nodes, which did one or two apps really well for low power and low money. So uh, these are not general purpose solutions. Uh, usually you build something like this to run Linpack. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this is where we start getting into interesting times. I, I think I have a better picture of this somewhere. They built a monstrous cluster out of OMAP3 gum sticks. So the OMAP3 has an ARM Cortex-A8, a single core, and uh, a Power VR, an Imagination Technologies GPU in it. So they were getting halfway decent numbers. I've got, I got uh, numbers on this, on this machine. And then thank, thank God for Blue and Brian for hooking us up with the Texas Instruments rep that came here and talked to us at a special tech session a couple of years back because that Panda board was just, just a wonderful piece of machinery. I, I got to experiment with so many different workloads on there. 
found out what arms did well. You know, there's not a whole lot of RAM on it. There's a gig of RAM. You have to be kind of clever on how you, you move data around. Um, but that was a, that was a really interesting architecture. So we uh, built some some clusters out of those. And these last two conferences, SC nine, ten, and eleven, had a disruptive technologies subtrack. Now they have since gotten rid of that, so we can't be showing up in any oddball clusters built out of you know uh, people's uh, you know phones or something. I, they're, they're trying to reintroduce that subtrack, but I think it may be a while before they do that. Um, so let me quick and, and tell you about Mont Blanc. Mont Blanc is, is a substantially underwritten by Spain. They've got this at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and it's going to be built out of these, um, uh, it, it's a board, I, I believe the, form factor of the board is called Bull X, at least that's the new name. These are these are boards with, which have an interesting back fin on them. They shoehorn everything they need on there, which is mo mostly these really dense quad-core ARM uh, CPUs. And the one they're looking at right now is this, uh, um, well, are these, uh, the, the, the current generation has the quad-core A9s. Uh, when we get to Brian's piece, we can show you what products have the, the Cortex A9 on them. Uh, there's a lot of products out there. There's probably maybe 10% of them are actually quad core. Um, you can get A8s, but they're rapidly, you know, the way they turn over phones in the smartphone market, it's tough to find an ARM Cortex A8 in a smartphone now. They're all probably ARM <coughs> Cortex A9 or above. And you're starting to find alternate architectures in phone, phones now. So this is the this is the architecture that they're looking at for for the current revision of the Mont Blanc cluster, and and they're on pace. Uh, they they, they want to keep track with with the progress of the top 500 and the green 500. The green 500 maybe this year and maybe next year will probably break the three gigaflops per watt barrier. So they're they're keeping their eye on that to make sure that their that their hardware is running at the kind of uh, kind of frequencies and uh, kind of temperatures that, that you need to hit those targets. And yeah, okay. So they think if they keep on this pace, now we're talking about a pretty monstrous Exynos 5450 cluster, uh, 8,000 CP, 8,000 uh, chips anyhow, so that's you know, 8,000 times four cores. They're probably going to be well in that sort of space between the time that they hit the top of the green 500, either this year or next, to when they're at the top of the top 500 in 2017. And this is, uh, it looks like they're on pace to do this. They initially started out looking <coughs> at, at Tegras. So Don Becker is, he's over at NVIDIA now, and he's involved with the Tegra initiative. And these current boards that, that they show at conferences don't have Tegras on them, but they may, if, if they do some side by side with Samsung in the future, they may go back to Tegras for their processor. Um, so worst head fake ever. The president of ARM said they weren't interested in HPC. Nobody believed them and it's uh, it's good. They, uh, I think that was an interview in Wired uh, that he said that. There's a lot of people that are in this space building purpose-built systems for, for particular workloads. Uh, Calceta has a product that they've, that they've posted a lot of their benchmarks in particular um, at the Apache benchmark. Open benchmark is just published. Um, this uh, this is actually two pieces of of reference in an article by this guy, Peter Lusek, did a presentation of uh, how he got four gigaflops out of his out of his iPad at, at the HPEC conference. So the HPEC conferences are local conferences at Lincoln Labs every year in September. It used to stand for high performance embedding embedded computing. It's now high performance extreme computing, so they've kind of mixed up the, uh, the offerings. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of GPU guys are coming to this conference now. It used to be much more of a uh, um, uh, specialized machinery for defense applications. But it's an IEEE conference right, right now up at the Waltham West, I believe. Um, so real quickly, uh, as a segue to Brian's presentation, uh, a lot of the, the presentations that have been coming out recently have shown uh, have shown these ARM devices on on a Linux distro, 
and there seems to be some convergence uh, towards uh, a, a 3.8 kernel that's going to be uh, the same on both platforms, possibly as early as the next version of, uh, of Android uh, Keyline Pi. Um, that sounds like a little too brisk of a pace. I mean, I certainly have uh, distros that, that you stick them on your ARM device and you get 3.8 3 as your kernel. Uh, that's not always true with, it. I have these for all my Samsung devices, the Samsung 4412, which is the quad-core ARM Cortex-A9, and the Samsung Exynos 5250, which is the dual-core A15, you can put the same distro, Fedora 18, on there and get different kernels. Um, and I think it's because of the, the BSP that you're getting out of. These are from two different Korean uh, ODMs in Signal and uh, hard kernel. So, so they, you're not, you're not always getting the exact, the exact distro that you're getting on another platform. Um, so I gotta thank Tom Metro for sending me this picture. So forget the, forget the performance half up here. Forget the, <laughs> forget the numerator. Look at this denominator down here. So anybody who recognize that? So that's the, uh, so those are the 13 port USB hubs that we've been using with our Panda board clusters. So what that means is, so you're driving every one of those nodes. This, this thing is a, this is a Bitcoin mining operation. <laughs> Probably to some poor computer professor's lab and he doesn't even know it's there. Um, but each one of those OTG connections is, you know, 500 milliamps, five volts. So you're, you're, if, when you're working the, the, the bottom half of the equation, you've got lots of room that you could experiment with down here. And what, what really blows my mind, so we daisy chained a lot of these. We tried to get a, a fully transparent, you know, N to M40 node cluster. Uh, these, you can daisy chain these things to USB 2.0 2 chips deep. So, so these guys all have full transparency. You can not only use them for power, but you can use them for USB net, which is probably the worst network on the planet, <laughs> but it's there. It's our out, we use it for our out-of-bound network, um, or excuse me, out-of-band network to do a gangway monitoring. So how do we work the low end of that, uh, of that ratio? Uh, you guys probably saw John Masters talk here uh, two months ago. So he, he's powering his Calceta um, energy core uh, system with, with a bike and a magnetometer. Is that what this is called? And then we've, we've done two or three Beowulf barn raisings with solar powered supercomputers here. So I think we're, uh, you know, the solar power is way too much for, for modern clusters. So we, we're going to have to find some other way to, to power these solar power outputs. So, <laughs> so the, so you guys know how to build Tesla turbines, right? This is this is one box of CDs with the CD lid, and a Tesla turbine uh, runs. So you, we can put out in the Charles River, have the water run under it, and it, it uh, it's an extremely efficient way to. to you know, Tesla, he's, he has patents on everything. You know, transmitting power across the Atlantic. He's got patents on all that stuff. So. Oh, they're expired. <laughs> oh, is that, is that right? <laughs> So, University of Idaho is working on that one. So, I don't <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, and I don't really have a good a good logo for supply mm -hmm. run response supercomputing yet. So I put hover cat up, and uh, this is DC, this is DC, this is AC. So you guys know uh, how hover cat works. Mm -hmm. So, so hover cat. The premise, the theory behind hover cat is a cat will always land on its feet. And buttered toast will always land butter side down. So when you <laughs> drop it, it just hovers <laughs> off the ground at probably about 75 hertz. So it's probably, you know, <laughs> 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 so the hover cat must be from the same litter as Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> <laughs> so, so supply and response supercomputing, that's, that's the, the project we're looking at because, because we can, um, we basically have an instant on board now. We got this Panda board or this Odroid or or Arndale board. We just yank it out of the wall and we plug it back in and it starts up in less than 10 seconds. I mean, a safe shutdown is gonna take us less than 10 seconds or more than 10 seconds. So we've got checkpoint and restart going on anyhow, just to be safe and probably a, a five to 8% overhead on that. So, so we, we're, not, we're not putting any sort of backup, any, any re reverse UPS or any of that stuff on here. We're just saying, just plug it into your, to your OTG hub and you're off to the races. 
So this is another quote, another famous god at the pantheon of the it's a Feynman quote. Um, and this is, of course, a Raspberry Pi cluster where the guy used Legos. So, so this this might have been the cheapest cluster you could go. It's a 128 node cluster, and I don't know what the performance is. We could somewhere down there we start losing our economies of scale. <laughs> I haven't found that yet. But uh, but we have compared <coughs> we compared one of our uh, first clusters here that we worked on with Brian and, and the BLU gang was a Shiva plug cluster that we used for solar solar power. Um, we've got the Genesia Fika MXs, and uh, there's the Sandia Strongbox cluster. And there's our Pandaborn cluster. Um, so, so the next cluster, sometime before November, will will probably be built around these um, these uh, probably the Samsung uh, 5250 because it's got two of these ARM Cortex A15s that you saw way at the top of the, the Blanc Mont uh, of the Mont Blanc list. But it's also got this ARM Cortex, or excuse me, this uh, Mali T604 GPU. So in your typical phone, if you had a Qualcomm phone, you'd get an Adreno GPU. If you had, a, um, say, a TI phone, you might get an uh, Imagination Technologies Power VR SGX 535 GPU. But if your phone has all ARM parts in it, you're going to get a GPU from ARM called a Mali. Uh, if, it's, if it's an ARM Cortex A9, it's probably a Mali 400. But these T604s will support OpenCL. So we haven't been able to run any benchmarks on Linux, but there's lots of people saying 72 gigaflops just from the GPU on Android. So we're going to see if we can recreate that, that experiment. So all of a sudden, we, we're going from, I don't know if you see these numbers here. We've got, you know, uh, in the megaflops on our Cortex A8, in the low dozens or so of gigaflops on the ARM Cortex A9, Way up to you know almost 100 gigaflops on the on the ARM Cortex A15. So it goes well. Same footprint. Everything's five watts or less. <laughs> <you know. laughs> so this is the dawning um, 5000A. So I wanted to leave with this as a segue to uh, uh, Brian because this is this is the the Chinese are very interested in MIPS. So we haven't looked much into MIPS in the U.S. Uh, very much recently, but they've gone from from their early dawning systems were uh, like the Godson. Uh, uh, they they were MIPS light cores, but they've managed to license the entire MIPS architecture now. So which is interesting because the company that makes the GPUs for the OMAP three and OMAP four, Imagination Technologies, just bought MIPS Limited in, in Great Britain, and so uh, so it's interesting to see that it looks like MIPS is is going to be around for a while. And I will test out that architecture too. I'm very bullish on ARM. I think we're going to hit this little threshold where ARM, ARM Cortex A15s are, are giving us all sorts of interesting places to innovate. We'll have to look at new file systems and Beowulf cluster our brains out. And uh, but uh, but then the 64-bit uh, ARM will be coming online down the road, and we'll see how that compares uh, flops per dollar, flops per watt, uh, flops per square foot on on these other 13, 32-bit architectures. So we can, you know, MIPS earlier arms and uh, some of these ones. So, so, I, so this is my segue to the, uh, to the... the only question before the segue. Yep. You, met, you mentioned on, uh, on the slide about the 1340 USB hubs. Yeah. And I, I've heard so many uh, things about pro, uh, power problems with uh, hubs that have lots of uh, uh, too many USB ports on Right. So what, what models uh, do you recommend that actually work well? So it, it appears, I, I took the lids off mine, but I looked at his on that photo. That's almost certainly a company called Kotech, K-O-U-T-E-C-H. And then I've also found ones that have have um, 25 ports, and you know, there's, you, you can buy these, these places that do um, flash disk duplication have like 64 ports, but you're not going to get network out there, you're just going to get power. And those things, they're not plugged into DC. There's a Mondo, you know, uh, uh, wall work on those guys. I got to figure, my guy has to be running out of spec. Because if I'm running five watts per per board, and I have 13 of them hooked up, I'm, I'm definitely over three or four amps, right? So, but my wall work says two amps on it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, fuzzy math. So I will introduce Brian. Um, anything else?
you know anything about the blue gene that, uh, that, that has somehow facilitated energy efficiency over the cyst architectures? No? Um, no. I, uh, power systems were not very green originally, so I don't, I don't know how it is that the blue gene has got there. I know they were working on it. Are there going to be more blue genes? They're not going to get the Z, right? I mean, that would be. I don't know. <laughs> I, unfortunately, I don't have problems that have me talking to that side of IBM much. I'd like to have a problem that requires that question. I mean, I work for IBM. I haven't clicked. Oh, really? So uh, yeah, so originally we, we, we talked about doing this, and uh, one of the tentative titles was Android Sticks and Stones, just because it's kind of like a common you know, throwaway phrase. And uh, it actually has more significance, too, because one of the big companies in China that makes these chips is Rockchip. So that's the closest we came to. Uh, but anyways, it, it, the Sticks and Stones seem to have sort of a bad connotation for Android. So the, 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 we really are kind of on the dawn of, uh, and I actually hadn't seen the, the, uh, the slide that Kurt had about the Chinese in particular going for MIPS, and I didn't know about the imagination technologies. Although I will say I bought some of their stock a while ago, and boy, they were just like, because like Apple and Intel invested in them in a big way. And, uh, and so today I stand here holding Intel stock and wondering how long I should, but, but uh, particularly with the onslaught of our developers. So I still believe that, that Intel, just given the massive technology base and capabilities they have both in terms of software, the intellect, and the manufacturing capacity will sort of, you know, c come back particularly down the power curve. Uh, Kurt talked a little bit about, you know, kind of the power thresholds. I mean, it just is amazing that these devices have single-digit power consumption profiles. Th these devices meaning particularly, you know, kind of some of these devices that uh, we're going to eventually give away today. I, I think uh, one of them already disappeared. But, uh, but you know, that, that's, uh, I think I got it over here, maybe, let's see. Uh, it's, it's, it was tied on the back of this thing. It'll, it'll turn up, I'm sure. Uh, but, you know, for here, for here, for instance, is, uh, uh, you know, this is one of these so-called Android sticks that I don't know if people have seen them. People is going to talk a little bit uh, about a device that he's recently gotten. This particular one actually has a camera in it. And, uh, you know, basically they have an HDMI plug of some sort. And HDMI is kind of one of these, these interesting standards that I've found because I've got a bunch of different, like you've got TVs and you've got monitors, displays that do HDMI, but it, so far I haven't had a lot of luck with them universally connecting satisfactorily to all these devices. So uh, when John asked earlier about the USB hubs, what USB hubs do you have that you know really work well? I've got a couple of USB hubs here which are uh, Terrifically innovative. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, slots on it. It actually has each each individual slot has a switch on it, which is really pretty cool because it's it's uh, on the one hand it you know potentially could save energy, but it actually is really useful if you're testing different devices. You can just kind of turn it on or off, right? So it costs maybe like about eight dollars or so from geekbuying.com, and uh, but I don't know if it really works. You know, it certainly hasn't worked a hundred percent of the time for me. And that may just be because the sensitivities of some of these uh, smaller devices, in terms of the amount of power that they both consume and can put out, particularly through their various, they've got typically like a USB on the go port and, um, you know, and, and maybe one other power port, which they may have. Some of these devices are powered purely from the USB uh, feed on your laptop or your, some of them actually suggest, or some of the, the word on the net is, you should power it from the internet, from uh, a desktop computer because it has more power than it pushes out the USB hubs. Some of them do come like this one, particularly with a uh, with power, a DC power as well. So, uh, so, so we really are on the dawn of the threshold, I think, 
of uh, just really new novel computing platforms. And, and Linux is really central to, uh, I, I think, what's powering this forward, particularly because of the Android push, the prevalence of Android, the fact that Android, how many people have actually done any kind of Android programming? So a couple. How many people have an Android device? Phones, so you know, two thirds, I, I'd say, and maybe that's that's um, more and more. I think what you'll see is, particularly with the convergence of the Linux kernel that that's out there in the mainstream 3.8 or whatever it is, and also the work that's gone on to the Linux kernel in Android, where there's been a lot of effort. And I'll talk a, a bit about this. And actually, this I'll give a plug for this book, Embedded in Android, which we'll raffle off uh, by the end of the meeting. Really, it is. It's a it's a new book. It's a terrific book. And it's the first time that I've sort of gained a little bit of an understanding about how this convergence of the Linux kernels is taking place. So for instance, one of the things that, uh, that Android, the Android developers had to push the, the envelope on what Linux could do, particularly around power. The Linux wasn't for the desktop and servers. It was an always on, kind of just you know throw more, more waterfall powers at, at it. And you, you know, as long as you have plenty of power, Linux is going to keep running. When Android moved to the phones, so much of it was about how you manage power on these limited capacity batteries. You're competing with other uh, technologies. So they really had to tweak, uh, uh, add to, enhance Linux. And, and they kind of did it in the upper levels of the Android stack so that it could be more power efficient on phones. Those kinds of uh, improvements, enhancements to the software kernel are being basically mainlined back into uh, to what we're seeing. The other thing that is, is eventually gradually being mainlined back in are they're just, from what I understand, has anybody ever done any ARM low level programming on the kernel? So from what I understand from people who have, is that there's just lots of like if depths. You know, there's a lot of stuff that if it's this chip, then you know, here's a whole bunch of code. If it's this chip, then it's a, here's a whole bunch of code. And typically the best place to get a Linux kernel for one of these ARM chips has been actually from the chip vendor itself. Not from Linux.org, not from wherever you get your, fa your favorite <coughs> kernel, but from the chip vendor. So then the other thing, Kurt used a, a, an acronym, BSP. People know what BSP is? Somebody want to explain what that? You want to give it a, a, a shout? Well, it makes it sound better than it is. Board support package. It's not well defined for Linux, what it means to get Linux running on your board, but it's messier than it might prefer. Right, so oftentimes it's like a binary blob. It's like stuff that you know it will make uh, Linux. It'll make software run on that vendor's board, and they may or may not release the sources to it. For that's you know it's binary source, right? And and so uh, it, it's kind of good because it makes the board work, but it's not good because in fact it's not open source. It doesn't reveal you know sort of it, it raises chip compatibility issues. Uh, for instance, Raspberry Pi. People are all you know. Uh, have heard of it, or have you? How many people have a Raspberry Pi board? So a handful, um, and it's it's uh, you know terrific kind of uh, board like an Arduino uh, <coughs> sort of thing. But there are a number of binary blobs that go along with it, which haven't been released into open source uh, for for lots of good reasons that Broadcom or whoever the chip vendor might have. The problem with that is that when it comes to uh, developing compatible solutions with particularly like webcams area that I have some interest in. And, and, uh, but to actually pick a webcam off the shelf and have it work with a Raspberry Pi, highly unlikely from, from what I gather. And it's largely because what really is open source Linux, um, you know, low level kernel stuff that has been embedded in mainstream to work with webcams, works great on, the, on sort of the mainstream desktops, doesn't work well with lots of different chip vendors because they haven't opened up that part of, of their platform. So, uh, so these are some of the motivating things that, um, you know, to kind of get us going here. So just as a baseline discussion, Kurt touched on a lot of these, just want to make sure that we're all at the same point. So it's ARM versus Intel, I think most people know what that, you know, what that's all about. Um, uh, the, the, you know, people have very different approaches in terms of how they sell product. And a big thing, well, BSP versus source, we talked about risk versus CISC. Uh, Kurt talked about standards versus proprietary, so, and that kind of gets into some of this BS open versus closed. Uh, clearly, I think the, the, the uh, majority of folks in this room probably are at least interested in open 
solutions, although you know some of us are making happy use of our uh, Windows systems and you know really have a hard time getting by without them in some in some capacity. Uh, some of the motivators for me are clearly, you know, you can use these technologies for education, commercial use, or public use. And what we're seeing now with ARM in particular, I don't think I have anything sort of in the front of this, you know, to, to the uh, left of the O'Reilly book, uh, and you know, excluding th this device that was like made in America. I mean, you know, all these things, the USB, the Mezi, uh, the, the, you know, these are boxes, and one of the problems is I, I don't even like know who made these. Things. You know, you kind of know who the chips are made by, and so you can trace the chip back to a vendor. Like this says, a rock chip, uh, 3066 in it, dual core uh, processor, really nifty thing, runs Android beautifully, kind of lets me get into the Linux end of things. But, uh, you know, if I had to find an address of who actually manufactured this box, I haven't got a clue. Uh, and so that's, but anyways, it's, it's, it's the global marketplace for manufacturing. Um, and then talking about components versus complete, we'll get into that a bit, and then Linux versus, uh, versus Android. So increasingly, I think what we're seeing is rather than Android versus Linux, it will be Android and Linux, or Linux and Android. And there's a lot of commonality uh, to it. If you have questions, just you know, raise your hand, shout out. What are some of the drivers for the kinds of, uh, again, Kurt addressed a bunch of these things. With the ARM technology, for lots of different reasons that we won't get into, and for lots of different reasons that I hope Intel comes around to, uh, it, it is just lower. I mean, it's the reason why ARM processors are used in the vast majority of cell phones. Y you know, there are a couple that Intel has kind of uh, snuck into. There are a couple of tablets that Intel, the same with, another big driver here, of course, is tablets. I mean, this tablet phenomenon has been almost as explosive as, as cell phones, right? Uh, and typically, those all are using some variant of an ARM uh, processor. So this, in, in brief, the way the ARM technology works is they license a core technology. To, they, they don't make chips themselves that, that I know of. Uh, they sort of export that IP to vendors, could be in China, could be anywhere, who incorporate that IP into their own fabrication process. As opposed to Intel, which has its own you know, sort of computational engine and CPU technology, which they don't, to, uh, uh, you know, to a modern day extent, license out to, to the best of my knowledge. Right. They did way back when, when there was the 8086. What was the last time that they licensed the technology to? It was basically the 8086. The 486. When was it? 486. The 486. Okay. So that was, um, and they had to license that, right? Yeah. It was government mandated. It was government mandated. <laughs> and, and since then, they sort of, you know, people went their separate ways and, and built on that. And it's just a business model that people have, have chosen. Another big uh, driver is, is the price. Uh, in the same way that I don't have anything on this side of the table that uh, that's made in America, I don't have anything in the side of the table that costs more than hundred dollars. So every well, with the exception of this, which costs <laughs> better than hundred dollars, um, and you know, availability is another thing that that um, increasingly with these kinds of the chips that Kirk was talking about. You know, there's sort of a whole bunch of vendors in South Korea who who make these uh, you know kind of like the Droid Cube boxes that lots very powerful. You know. Uh, dual core, quad core, but there are a lot of different people who make the chips. It's it's really kind of a whole new world, and uh, and the size. The other thing is none of these things. You know, I, I might have lost one because they're so small. They're kind of hard to keep you know track of, which is part of the problem. With these things, uh, it's a little harder to lose them. You know, kind of fortunately, but but um, anyway. So once you have things that are portable, you pop them into your backpack or into your pocket or into your car, you know, it just, it opens up lots of new opportunities. So, uh, so the previous one th thing that we talked about was kind of, you know, there are lots of functionality drivers moving us forward. There are lots of technology drivers. This idea of the last nanometer, which, you know, I just made up, so it's, it's not really an idea, it's just, but <laughs> it's, it's uh, you know, the, the idea of the last mile, right? It's the continually shrinking mm -hmm. size of the circuitry in these chips is just phenomenal, right? And so, and clearly Intel, uh, it seems to me, has a huge lead in this space, which is, uh, you know, allows them to, to develop these complex uh, chips and the complex circuitry and stuff like that. But as other vendors, manufacturers, chip fabricators are figuring out how to make smaller and smaller and smaller, I don't know what you call it, but, you know, s circuit masks, um, it, it allows a bunch of different things around size, power, and price. Uh, we talked about ARM licensing. There are lots of chip vendors out there who are, just in the past month, and we'll see some video, I've kind of begun to realize 
the, just the explosion in China. It, to me, it's absolutely shocking, right? And, and Kurt kind of clued me in earlier on about the, um, the, you know, the work in South Korea. And it was really just a couple years ago that we were looking at TI and Marvell, and, right? And, and that was really only a couple years ago. And they, too, were arm vendors of a slightly different sort. And there's two kinds of licensing. Like Qualcomm has a unique license, uh, the top, the high-end license. You can you can sell a product that you made out of an ARM core, not call it an ARM core. They call it a right. right. That's, but it's it's kind of an ARM cortex. Right. There's, there's an IP license and there's an architecture license. Mm -hmm. So so Marvell, um, uh, uh, Qualcomm, now Nvidia, they all have the architectural license, which means they get to use the instruction set and make their own CPU. GPU colors. Whereas most of the other things, they just license what's called a hard IP, where you already have the design and you just put stuff around it and you fabricate it. Like the, the, the actual CPU design is uh, ARM's design. So you don't get to modify it. Whereas, whereas Qualcomm and NVIDIA, they can design one from scratch. So do they have to be instruction level compatible or something? I mean, what's what's the... Uh, it's really up to them. Yeah, so it, it, it makes sense to be instruction level compatible <coughs> so that you can use off-the-shelf uh, software so you don't have to have a custom compiled uh, kernel, custom GCC distribution, all this stuff, right? So you, you get to use the existing ARM ecosystem for free. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to be compatible. And in order to get that compatibility, you have to get an architectural license from ARM and you have to pay an ARM and a letter. <laughs> so, so the good news about that, the claim, I think, would be that, well, if we've got an architectural license, then we can enhance. Essentially, we can improve on. We can take, you know, start with this and this basic thing and improve on it. The downside uh, is, is that th these are compatibilities, which do surface, have surfaced, and are reasons why I think some of the mainstream distributions, you know, don't work cleanly on, on some of these things. And, and so what, you know, two years ago maybe was an opportunity through an architectural license to uh, enhance, uh, you know, a less mature uh, ARM uh, sort of core. N now what you, you're more faced with, I think, potential for incompatibilities. And what you see is some of these other chip vendors, and I don't know what the companies in China are doing, but I do know given the rapid pace at which they are spitting out chips, that, the, uh, you know, new designs like uh, from, from single core to dual core, to quad core and you know new tablet generations and things like that. It really is just at such a rapid pace that I don't think they're spending lots of time customizing and enhancing. So there, there are cost factors and standardization factors as well. Um, you know this HDMI standard. I don't know enough about it. Uh, all I just know from practical <laughs> hands-on experience is that they they have their different connectors. They don't all work at all. You know you do get into situations with 720 versus 1080 versus I think that, that HDMI, is, you know, VGA is just going to disappear. And HDMI is the way to go. It's more compact. It's more robust connectors. It's simpler. It's easier. But it, there's, some, there's some gotchas. Um, mass production, which we'll actually see a little video of, and, and uh, this Android Linux convergence that we talked about. The drivers for the tablet market, what you'll see in the, in the, the videos that we'll, we'll kind of go to, uh, well, they're talking about a bunch of different things, but a lot of it is tablet driven. You know, tablets are everywhere. Um, th it's, you know, it's not just from Apple, it's not just from the Google Nexus stuff, it's not from, how many people have a tablet? How many people have two tablets? <laughs> okay. So how many people have more than two tablets? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, you know, the, 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 the problem is that they're, um, they're just out there. You know, a lot of them are Android. How many people have an Android tablet? For, uh, how about a Mac tablet? So a couple, you know, a couple, people who have multiple tablets seem to have, you know, <laughs> one of each, which is, uh, Diverse, but that's good. Um, anyways, Android is, is kind of out there in drivers. Software, just to talk about this, you know, every, the software growth is this is just a, a chart I grabbed. Uh, just lots of people using Android, which is good from a Linux perspective, particularly because, it, you know, Linux is at the, the foundation of Android. And, and uh, the problem is that it's so buried, in Linux, from a Linux perspective, it's so buried beneath so much other important stuff. And we can talk about you know, why it needed to be that way. But um, that it, as somebody who's interested in or attending a, a blue user group meeting might wonder, well, is Android, Android just getting in the way of the kind of fun stuff that I might want to do with Linux? I've, and, and lots of different releases of, of Android. You know, there are lots of puzzling reasons why when I jumped in as an earlier adopter back here, I don't get to 
have the full benefit of ice cream sandwich and you know and should I and will I ever um, it's just this is all stuff off the web which we can make available yeah the, the one is mentioned on, uh, on the blue uh, mailing list that um, apparently on the uh, on the Nexus 4 tablet you can run a, a full Ubuntu under a Chiruta environment so so maybe talk about the Chiruta environment you want to just give a brief blurb on what that is it's well I don't know any more than the show I'm doing so, so, the, so the, the only little, little bit I know, I should add that to the baseline. Um, so the, the CH root, not quite sure how you pronounce it, but basically what it does, what is it? True, true. It, it, um, it essentially sets up uh, a sandbox of a Linux environment, okay? So you're operating within a software uh, enclosed area that simulates the, the Linux environment, as I understand it. That's as opposed to a kind of a native Linux environment that is just talking directly to the hardware. So in a, a, a chur root environment, which is actually the way a couple of years ago I actually oh, built it. A chur root environment is talking native to the hardware. Yeah, but when you're, it, 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 it is. It's just locked into a subset of the file system, so it doesn't have access to anything outside of that one when I subtrade. Right, so at least as I understand it, you could then run, for instance, uh, you can run software in that environment that is essentially operating in a ins somewhat insular environment. You're relying on your, you're not exposed to the hardware. Well, it is exposed to the hardware. It's using the same kernel that the Android is using. It just can't touch any, anything else out of the Android uh, system. The file system is limited in, in what the true environment can see. Yeah. Right, so what was your question? Hmm? What was your question? No, it wasn't a question, it was just an observation. Oh, okay, okay. So, so anyways, the chur root environment is important. And my understanding, this just dates back to the, the first time when I built the Chrome OS stuff, right, which was a couple of years ago. It was done in a chur root environment because it was sort of a safer, sandbox, standardized way that essentially isolated you. It, it was kind of like this. Uh, this surprise, you know, it sort of it bumps you up a level in, in the environment that you're working in. So that's a more predictable environment to work in. Probably bad uh, explanation. It, it doesn't bump you up a level. It just restricts the what part of the file system uh, right. that server processes can have access to. You know, it right. can't uh, tamper with files outside that subroutine. Right. So it's still talking directly to the hardware. Though. Yep. And and so so actually that that's kind of a good uh, segue into this uh, this slide, which is kind of complex, and I'm not going to go through it. But uh, but so here's the deal with these devices. They all are basic. They're running Android, and we just saw from the previous architecture. Uh, picture, the Linux kernel is at the base of Android. We also talked about, there, you know, there are some differences in the Linux kernel that is running in Android and some, you know, and maybe in the mainstream for like power management and things like that. But another thing that uh, this process that, that, that happens here, the boot timeline, so any, and Kurt talked about instant on and stuff like that, the, the uh, you know the boot process is either it's on a chip, it's on a flash, it's on it's it's you know in some way embedded. It's not like you're running a desktop computer and it's getting loaded. It's loading everything in at, at launch time. In these kinds of under sub hundred dollar devices, the stuff is burned in. Okay, and one of the things that that some of the vendors have done, not particularly the one <coughs> that we're going to give away. So we're going to do a little giveaway here. This Rico Magic uh, device. But you have to get into the bootloader in order to redirect the boot process away from Android and over to sort of your version of Linux and, and, and your chosen distribution, whether it might be Ubuntu or some other thing. People, what is the distribution that you're running on the? It's called the Linaro. And it's, uh, Linaro is a consortium of a few companies who uh, mm -hmm. together um, distribute a, a, di a variety of uh, Linux. Uh, the one that I have here with me uh, is running a version of Ubuntu uh, 1204 yeah, that's been uh, customized by the Lenaro Consortium. Uh, they produce a new release every month. So when we, we'll show some hardware and then maybe ask Pebo to come on up and he can show what he's got going and we can talk through it. So, uh, you know, the first thing that, that's got to happen is the system's got to boot up, right? And it loads in a lot of software. And all that software, of course, has to be compiled for an ARM environment, which is what kind of Lenaro his, its original mission to some extent was, which was to get the Linux world and the distributions, and in particular Ubuntu, sort of <coughs> friendly with the ARM hardware platform, right? So you can't just take a, an Ubuntu distribution off of uh, uh, the, the Ubuntu site and download it, and, you know, 32-bit or 64-bit. You need an ARM. Now Debian's a different story. 
If you go back to Debian, they so, sort of support. Did anybody run Debian here? Right. So uh, you know, uh, it, it, it supports a number of ARM processors, and and uh, and and then Ubuntu and other people, Canonical, they can choose whether or not to sort of you know bring that Linux Mint, for instance, which is you know my my sort of uh, preferred administrative desktop under Linux right now. They don't have any ARM distributions. Whereas Debian has, you know, has a whole whole suite of them. But the point is that some of these vendors have made it difficult for you to sort of get out of the the um, you know the boot process and into the Linux kernel, so that you can then go off and install something like Ubuntu. <coughs> Not all of them, but some of them. Um, so it's really interesting what's going on in that in the, basically that middle space, the boot manager. I mean, most of my devices use U-boot, but I've seen Red Boot, I've seen CFE. There's all sorts of innovation going on at that space. And one of these days, somebody's going to have a machine that just runs U-boot, that's it. You know, because it's Dodge City. You can do anything you yeah. want to U-boot. You can load it up with, with networking. You know, it's crazy what people are doing with U-boot. Yeah. And, and, and it's kind of like, this to me is, it's, uh, I have no idea what goes on in this space. I'm, you know, I'm pretty curious about it. But th there's a lot of magic that goes on. This other thing here, UEFI shell, uh, that's kind of a new standard boot process that I think Intel might have been the early advocate for. So yeah, Kurt's definitely right. There's a lot of magic that happens here. This is kind of, you know, this is the hacker's heaven, right? This is where people are making these. And, and this this kind of is, it's interesting because it's where software and hardware meet to, to a very, it's, it's the boot process. A lot more sophisticated than what used to be, uh, you know, just the BIOS, kind of like the, in the Phoenix BIOS days, right? It's a little different way to look at it. Uh, all these things are, y you know, it, it, it's well beyond me. But, uh, you know, Grub is another one that people, who, anybody who's, you know, had, had uh, experience with Ubuntu probably is very familiar with. The master boot record. The, the way these devices typically are configured hardware-wise is they have a mainstream boot process. Uh, I was told that one of the chips, uh, I won't mention the name, but one of the chips can't boot from uh, an external you know, device. It can't boot from an SD card. So for instance, with the Genesee devices, when we were working with them, uh, those could, uh, they had Freescale chips in them, and they were ARM you know, kind of at the core. Uh, they could boot comfortably from SD cards, and that was a lot of the fun in, in working with them. Some of these things can't, but the way they're architected is that they have a mainstream boot, and then they have kind of a backup. So if you get really deeply hosed, the, and, and you need to sort of, and actually Android has, I'm not quite sure where it is in the user interface, but uh, it, it's got like a, you know, a safety reboot option in it. And if you go into that, it knows to go to this other place, and then what they do is they grab that launch process and they boot these little devices from the alternate. It's like, you know, you get a mainstream, which is probably on some form of flash, and then you have this other alternate pathway to boot from. The way most of these people are modding these systems to boot into distributions like Ubuntu is they're basically kind of uh, taking over that backup uh, <coughs> flash, installing a variant of Ubuntu or your, your recompiled ARM code into that space and telling the system, okay, reboot from my fallback system, okay? And that, so that, it, it's, a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty hokey way of doing it. It's a, it, it gets you going, we'll, we'll talk about it. So these are the different boxes, uh, and as you can see, they're not, you know, this is one of the boxes. It costs, I think I got the price on it, $67. Uh, one of the things that's really cool about this, and this is, uh, I got it from, from, from uh, Geek, what was it? Um, it'll come to me. But it, yeah, geekbuyer.com. Yeah, geekbuyer.com. Uh, a lot of them are playing off of these, these little wireless keyboard and, um, and, and mouse combination. So you stick, it's just 2.4 gigahertz, I think, in here. So it's not Bluetooth or anything like that. Um, but but th this is, you know, they typically only have like one full-sized USB port. Uh, they might have an SD port. They might have, uh, they might have an on and off switch, but you, you might not be able to find it. it you know, is this the case? <laughs> so this, it's, it really, it's like, now this is when I, I think Kurt, actually Kurt and I were here the, uh, over the weekend to kind of you know uh, do this in a dry run. And I think I said one of these things wasn't working. I just couldn't find the on switch. I mean, that was pretty much the problem. Yeah. So, so um, the, the other thing in terms of the, 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 you know, the fun part of, oh, by the way, not, you know, the doc documentation is not particularly good. And, 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 yeah, this, and, and I'm not particularly good at reading it, even if it works. So, so that's the problem. So I, I couldn't figure out 
uh, two things with this. One is I couldn't figure out how to turn it on, which was a bit problematic. And um, what is it? Oh, well, that's that. that I you know I did figure that part. Anybody get that? <laughs> <laughs> So it's remote control, and it's got like you know motion, and and it's it's got a keypad, and it's got a I I think. Well, I it's it's um I think the on off is this Android. But it used to uh, it used it's not just a remote; it's also a keyboard. It's a key, it's a keyboard and a mouse, basically, right? So um, and it might be kind of a gaming thing too. I haven't quite figured it out. But the thing is, I couldn't understand for the life of me why they sold you the keyboard. But they didn't give you this little, you know, wireless adapter, right? That that was really that was problematic. So I spent days searching Amazon to see if I could buy one of these, you know, wireless adapters. And of course, you can buy Bluetooth adapters and Wi-Fi adapters and all kinds of adapters. But you know, then if you want to say port, you can actually get a combination of Bluetooth and uh, the other end, you know, wireless. Yeah. So so there's all that kind of stuff. But then I, I figured, well, go to YouTube, which is where everything else is. And I saw a guy who op took the back off and pulled out, here's the wireless adapter that you use as a connecting point, which is really clever, because then, you know, when you're done with it, you put it right you back in. You hide it inside. And you hide it inside, yeah. <laughs> I need a thought I'd figure this out before, you know, because it needs batteries. I, we're not quite at the point where it hurts. Telepathy uh, approach. Uh, so, so, yeah. So this is what you get with this with this for for sixty nine dollars sixty seven dollars. First of all, I get an HDMI cable, which costs a few bucks, right? and it's a very nice. I'll say it's one one of the most stylish HDMI cables I've ever seen. <laughs> Black and red, and, and um, it's good for all sorts of things. And it comes with an antenna, so it's got uh, it's got wire. And also the other big thing is it's got an Ethernet port on it. So one of the problems criticisms of all these stick devices is. The wireless sticks. Okay, so none of them have. Well, that's that's, that's an exaggeration. But um, the, the the wireless is problematic for, for many of these stick these Android sticks, right? But first of all, they don't have external antennas, which you know we all know is a problem. And uh, so the solution for this company was to both provide add an external antenna, which is pretty good, and and uh, also to provide Ethernet, which is terrific. So you can easily use something like this. Under Android, it comes with a browser for you know throw it in your kitchen and look up recipes on the web, and it's it's more than adequate. And it's a couple of watts of power, might be up to four or five uh, during boot up and during access. But uh, it, it's really it's a terrific thing. The only one I know of at this point that has Ethernet. Here's another one, uh, the MK808. It's it's uh, similar in design form factor to the one that we're going to give away today. Uh, it, it's not as powerful, and, and again, I don't know who actually made this thing. Um, and it turns out that I did buy it from Amazon, which was somewhat reassuring. But it turns out there's like this Clone Wars out there now for these devices, right? And so there are three different uh, types, vendors, manufacturers of these. They all say the same thing. It's, we'll see one of the videos where they basically self-screen on the logos. And it's just, you know, and it's, you know, now it's made by this company, and then now it's made by another company. So, uh, and the way you tell which, and it makes a difference somewhat, because some of them have different Wi-Fi uh, sort of single signaling mechanisms and antennas and things like that. By the way, m many of these, I guess all of them probably, have some kind of an SD card in them. And so for anybody who's been to, you know, to China, you may know, you kind of have to, it's, it's like, you know, the price is right, but, and this guy, Charbox, who will, we got a little video from later, he bought like a 32 gigabyte card. You know, he got back to the hotel room and it was really four gigabytes, right? So <laughs> it says 32 on it, and it looks like it's a 32 gigabyte card, but, you know, but at least you're getting a four gigabyte, you know, it did, it did seem to work, apparently. Uh, anyways, there, there are several different, and the thing is they're not clones in the sense of prescription medicines that have gone generic, where you're really, you know, pretty guaranteed it's the same formulation. In this case, they might look the same, but, you know, they might weigh the same, they might even cost the same, but there's a pretty good chance that they're not the same. So, you know, this whole question of branding for these kinds of, it, it, it's kind of an open, so there's a video on how to open up your device to check based upon the color of the insulation of the wiring, <laughs> <laughs> you know, who made it, right? 
And so here's a company, Meezy. These folks are really, I think, I think it's a nice, a good <coughs> company. Uh, there's a guy out there. I give the, you know, a footnote here, uh, who's doing some. He basically has taken this thing apart. He's working hard to get the Linux recompiled. He's working hard, basically, to, to bring support in for the Kim. So what Meezy has done is they have released a product that that is an Android product that works with. Um, the, the camera does things, and it's also got a microphone on it, right? And he's working hard to get Linux or some variant of Ubuntu uh, to, to be compatible with it. So there are a couple of things going on here that you should notice right off the bat. One is that it's got this HDMI connection sticking out the end of it, right? And that is probably <coughs> really problematic for somebody. The way these, these are designed is they're supposed to be like TV sticks, right? So the idea is you stick these things on your TV, you can watch Netflix movies, or you can surf the web, or you can, you know, you connect it basically directly into your television set. The, the problem is, at least for a few of my devices, you know, you can't get the thing stuck in far enough because the contours and the sleek designs of the packaging prevent that from happening. Same with, you know, HDMI monitors that you may have. It turns out that these, uh, you know, so you need really an adapter, is what I'm saying. Well, the Rico Magic folks, very impressive packaging. They actually include one of those adapters in along with uh, the device that, that they send you. An adapter being a two foot HDMI cord? It, it Maybe six inches, but yeah, but, but basically exactly that. And, and I, can you buy them? Has hey, anybody ever bought one? You must be able to buy one somewhere. I was going to look for it, but then it came with the package. So here, here's, uh, it turns out actually I had, I had bought the, this keyboard from geekbuying.com prior to actually getting the, uh, the camera device as well. And it's really a slick thing, and it wasn't much more than about $30. So here's the thing. I, uh, um, <laughs> this, this, so about 8 o'clock yesterday morning, uh, a very nice guy, Andy Kirby, who is in the UK, I think, is where he is based out of, has been a proponent of getting Linux in its you know, purebred state running on these devices. And so he's, he's managed to support, sponsor, encourage a couple of developers. One guy in particular, or, or a couple people, who have developed a, a version of Ubuntu they refer to as uh, Pacuntu, P-I-C-U-N-T-U, I think. And it's sort of you know a Pica version, or a Pica's version of Ubuntu, a small version of Ubuntu. And uh, anyway, so I, I, I got this thing, uh, you know, uh, the Rico Magic one, because in some sense, they're the seminal piece of hardware in this effort to get sticks running pure Ubuntu. Uh, and we talked for, you know, back and forth for a bit. And I still didn't have this device like Azov. Well, we can, we can look at it. Azov, 3.06 PM. This was actually on the 16th. So it's like, oh yeah, Tuesday the 16th. So it, it, it like hadn't even been picked up in Hong Kong. And so I was a bit concerned that it's like the door prize is just going to be left in the loading dock at you know, Cincinnati. But if, you know, later on, just, you know, uh, <coughs> consider this. Basically, within 24 hours, it got from Hong Kong to here is is pretty much what happened, um, you know, through Cincinnati, which was probably no small chore. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it's just the point is that it, totally different world that we live in than two years ago or six years ago. Um, but here's what the Rico Magic Magic uh, package looks like. This device <coughs> right here uh, is the this you know HDMI extension. Various USB. I mean, this is like a cable person's uh, dream to have all these different, you know, because stuff doesn't, it's not, there are all these different sizes. I mean, even the SD cards. Uh, the Regal Magic it had actually had color pictures in the documentation, I think, which was pretty impressive. Uh, most of the documentation I've seen isn't quite that complete. Regal Magic also has, it's in this box here, it's one of the things that will raffle off. Very cool, although I didn't get a chance to use it. Um, they refer to it as an all-in-one wireless keyboard. This other keyboard from Easy is really quite nice. I'm sorry, I don't know what the price is on this one, but um, it, it has on. It, this is two sides. So there's a keyboard on one side, and there's like a TV remote control on, on the other side. So you kind of flip it back and forth. Really, really a kind of a cool, slick-looking device. Um, okay, Pro, some project ideas. So I, I was mentioning this to somebody. Uh, these, you know, all of these cool devices. And, and then I pretty much discouraged them from getting one. And it, it, they weren't people who you know, typically have kind of cracked open the packages or dug into the software. They, uh, you know, they, 
So if you're an end user interested in, but, but it's buyer beware would be would be my point. If you're not willing to buy some extra cables and you know hunt around for some extra devices and maybe get a, a device that doesn't work and you know and then have to buy another one that does work, <coughs> th this might not be for you quite. Yeah. On the other hand, if you're interested in kind of hacking around with this stuff, it, the, just the, the technology is is potentially unlimited. There are three project ideas that we wanted to put out there. A sage who people all, all probably know from past presentations couldn't make it tonight. But he's, he's continually been interested in this off-grid solar charge controller. Low-level stuff, um, you know, low-level chips, and kind of with solar energy. He's got, you know, the circuitry uh, skills that are, are really impressive. Kurt, I don't know if you want to say anything about it, but he's looking to get this thing going and off the ground. And in the past, he's done some impressive stuff. Um, we were trying to get him here tonight to run one of these. Texas Instruments had a very cool demonstration a few years back where they ran one of their boards off of just the electricity produced by grapes. So, you know, they have some kind of couple of grapes and some kind of chemical process going on. And uh, it was sufficient to power these very low uh, power consuming devices. Uh, they wanted to point uh, Sage and, and uh, this fellow Steve, uh, they're particularly interested in this uh, protection of wildlife. I don't know if people are, you know, have seen the, the, the link here is of a, a few weeks or months ago, a helicopter went down there. People are like poaching, you know, the tusks off of rhinos and things like that. And it's just, you know, species that are, are doomed to be extinct. Uh, and the, sadly, in this particular case, the protectors of the, of the rhinos were in a helicopter and the helicopter went down and I think five people died or something like that. Um, so they've got this idea for remote cameras to, to put out in the wildlife areas, habitats that are uh, sort of powered by solar and could be signaling and, you know, kind of keep a watch on, on, uh, on these species. And so if you're interested in that, get in touch with Steve. If you're interested in the solar stuff, get in touch with Sage. And so here's this Blue Micro project, okay? So um, this is an idea that, that is being put out there now. I, I have Kurt signed up to, to be um, you know, a, a participant in this. And um, here is, just to give you a sense of the, the, the volume of activities that are taking place, let me just. Oh, I don't have audio. Do I have audio? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a little, uh, there should be a wire hanging off the HDMI. Yeah. Is it this thing here? Uh, I, I can describe it. If we don't have, if we don't have audio, we, uh, that's okay. We don't, uh, we, uh, let's try and get audio before. All right. We don't need it for this one. If they can, if, if they're, while they're hunting for us, maybe this one. Uh, that looks good. good. Yeah. That looks yeah. about the right yeah. size. Yeah. We'll have to switch over to VGA for that. Or we'll we'll just try anything that that's, that's it. Can we feed it through? You so what you do? Let's try both. Brian's stuff? Yeah, and I don't think you'll be able to get the sound. Brian's stuff? Give me the audio for the VGA. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. We have the option to do audio from VGA and. Um, I don't think so. No. If we can, it, it might blast out. But uh, is Kurt? Thanks, Kurt, for helping with this. Basically, this guy Charbox went. He's in China right now, and he's at. Uh, this is the time of year when they have these big festival, you know, basically uh, electronic vendor festival, right? So this woman here, what she's talking about is she's talking about how they sell thirty thousand of those units a month, right? And she's just one of a dozen vendors, and and she. I think they're believable. I mean, I don't think they're completely making this stuff up, but <coughs> there are many, many vendors who are selling tens of thousands of tablets fr from their manufacturing operations a month to where? And it's not, it definitely isn't just the United States. It, you know, it's Russia, it's Africa, it's, I mean, it's all these countries, it's, it's places in Europe. Some of the, the manufacturers seem to specialize in different corners of the globe, it seems. Uh, this particular vendor, I believe, and you, you'll be able to actually read it on some of the uh, the posted signs. They have some of the rock chips, the 3066 and 3188. 3188 is this new quad card. Well, here you, you actually can see it. I mean, just look at the prices. You know, 50. So these things, that might be a quad core, uh, but they're, all of them are like fifty dollars or eighty dollars or. Uh, and I think that includes documentation. I'm not completely sure, but it's all similar design. You know, you've got USB, you've got HDMI out, you've got a place for an, for an SD card. Uh, some of them make these, you know, sort of netbooks, but 
But the big buzz at this show, clearly, and, and there's a link here to armdevices.net is the guy's website, and you'll be able to spend hours, if not days, just going through the videos, terrific videos, where he interviews these people about their tech. This actually may be made by uh, Meezy, um, uh, this particular, it's a USB base, and you can plug in the device to the <coughs> base, uh, and they, I'm quite certain actually it is Meezy, because the application is for Skype calls, so the idea is that you can have this base with the camera in their device, and you can have it facing whoever it is you're Skyping with, okay? So, uh, seven inch, uh, blah, 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 dual course, you know, <coughs> SIM card slot, eight, 58 bucks. Are those oh. Renmin <coughs> Was that? Is that, is that price in Renmin bin? <laughs> uh, that price is, I think, if you pick it up in Hong Kong. But, uh, but they all, everything's quoted in, in US dollars. It typically actually is in quantities of, you know, larger. So these are like wholesale prices, to be honest with you. Um, so we'll, we'll, that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll make it available to, uh, she'll keep talking for a few more minutes, but let's, we'll go back. And this is the one that we, I'll, I'll show it to you because actually it's, it's, and then you gotta promise to listen to it. This is the guy Charbuck. So he sent us his, uh, at, at my request, a video. This is, he's in China, and this is like midnight, okay, and, and last night. And you get the video, uh, and what he's talking about is these devices that, he just did a tour today of a factory in Shenzhen that is making quad core, I think stick, quad core 3188 uh, rock chip sticks. That, and he's got some you know, crazy price, and he talks about this crazy idea that we have. So it's only a minute video. He was very nice, and he stayed up until like, so he, I think he finished it probably around midnight from what I could tell, and then uh, probably took him until about four o'clock in the morning China time to actually get <coughs> the thing uh, uh, over to us. So you got you got to watch it, you, know, you got to listen to it, and if we can get the audio before the, the night is out, we'll do it. Um, okay, so he's he, what he does is he focuses on arm devices. He's been doing this for years. He's got a great website, and he really is an, an arm uh, expert in, from from a market perspective. So that's his website, armdevices.net. There are a couple of you know Kurt mentioned a couple of chip vendors. There are a bunch in China. That we you know there's all winter there's rock chip there's actions there's uh, th there are a number of different um, flavors of chips that we'll get to okay so here's the pitch right so that in terms of projects wh what I personally want is I want a box like this not exactly like this because that would be you know we don't want to copy their design but you know simple light small uh, under five watts of power has Ethernet in it has wireless in it. It, but you can just run a native, you know, a nice Linux distribution on it, right? Without jumping through hoops and trying to, and for like a crazy price. So the question is, what would you need to make this the ideal Linux box? Because that's what kind of brings people to this meeting, right? And just, so to keep in the back of your mind, they're in China, and in probably other countries, but for, you know, from what I know in China, these are all basically the gold sections are there different uh, functional components of, of the motherboard, right? And this motherboard is like a tablet motherboard, okay? So they are manufacturing these things in the gazillions in China. And they're kind of reusing, speculation on my part, but uh, similar designs. So there are ODMs, original design, manuf design houses basically, that are designing the boards. And there are OEMs, the people who are taking those designs and manufacturing them in large volume. Uh, they use uh, S, what is it, surface SMT lines. People know what SMT lines are? No. So surface mount technology lines, which are fully automated, you know, pick and place, show me the chips I need, and it just automatically goes through. And, you know, they churn out lots and lots of these boards, right? And then the, the detailed, hands-on, time-consuming, expensive process, uh, which are, you'll see videos, you should take a tour of the Shenzhen factories, um, Heavy hands-on assembly line operations. Ford would be pleased and proud. So you've got some people who take the boards and some people who solder things on and some people who kind of put the, the touch screens on and some people who put the covers on and some people who clean the covers and some people who do the packaging. It, mass production. Well, if you take away the screen, yeah, John? Have, have you seen any of these uh, two ethernet ports coming? 
Uh, well, certainly there is some of like even the, the TI. Not not these, because to get one Ethernet port's uh, remarkable. But I think there's nothing in the chipset that would uh, prevent it. And there was something I saw somewhere along the way that that um, you know, because it's like it's it's a cost factor and it's also a, a side factor. So pennies count, and, and that's another thing that you and, and that's a feature that most customers don't need. So it raises the cost point How much? Does, how much? Does we're talking about building a custom board. I've gone through like three of these devices where I really needed two Ethernet ports. So, so that's and the cost. And that was a showstopper. So, so what are other things that people, so two Ethernet ports would be kind of really nice, but what are the other things that you would need? An SD card, let me let me just jump ahead to a slide because I have a few of these components, right? So so these are the things that, can I use this pointer? And <coughs> not have to, uh, you know, so you need HDMI, you need some kind of RAM, but increasingly some of these chips, the SOCs actually have, you know, RAM of some sort, like, you know, built into them, right? You, this UFI, UEFI or bootloader or whatever the grub thing is, you need some, you need Wi-Fi, Ethernet, maybe two, uh, you know, some kind of microphone in, audio out, right? You need power, uh, you need SD or multiple SDs, or it'd be nice to actually be able to connect to a SATA drive by USB. I don't know if any of these could power a SATA drive. Just you know, off of you know, off of USB. Uh, you know, a bunch of you. My hang-up is there aren't enough USBs. You know, you might like two Ethernet. I like four USBs. They can't cost that much, right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, for me, and and for you too, uh, you can buy. We got you know, you can buy like these. This is an Ethernet adapter, right? Actually works. I, this I have worked on these devices for like about eight dollars. Yeah, I, I tried those on both the uh, Atika and on the Raspberry Pi. So, so the other thing firmware. is, I've probably tried four of these and like two worked, and because you know it's really, which is a sad statement on the, the you know the standardization effort, and so which is a problem, right? But but and because they're different chipsets and the chips aren't compatible, and, and that's the challenge that I, I do think we face. Um, so so these are, and then then some kind of SOC, right? And 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 part and parcel of this is of course a software environment that you can run on this. People, maybe you could talk now about your. Sure. Device. So I'm really bullish, Brian, on this e e EMMC. Yeah. It's it's it can you can use it for that ROM. You can get rid of SD. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's fast as hell, much faster than than even high quality uh, SD. Yep. <coughs> so so sort of EMMC. What else? What else would people like to see? Because here's here's basically the pitch, right? Kurt and I talked about this a little bit. It's to do a Kickstarter project um, and to get in touch with some of these vendors. And, you know, I don't care if they're in this country or that country. And and uh, you know, for them to spin out some number of boards at some agreed upon price that meets some level of standard software performance, right? That people don't have to stand on their head and you know uh, and, and do all sorts of crazy things to just get Ubuntu work. But people will talk to you. He'll show you kind of what he's got going here. Okay, so um, the company that I, well, let me give you a little background. Um, I recently got a Galaxy Nexus. And this is my first exposure to a really good uh, working phone. Um, it comes with Android, uh, but um, I flashed a system called Replicant on it, which is a variation of Cyanogen Mod. We'll, we'll switch this over. And, uh, so here's my phone experience with a battery that's uh, getting discharged rapidly. Um, I'm interested in ARM. I'd like to do some programming on it. You can stick it under the camera there. Everyone will be able to see it on the screen. You can stick it under the overhead camera. Oh, well, I, I'm not really going to demonstrate this. I'm just giving you some background. Um, yes, the Replicant runs a version 4.0.1 of um, Android, I believe. Um, and so I'm really enthusiastic about learning something. And I also, uh, I work for the Free Software Foundation, so I want to run uh, good new Linux on my machines. Uh, and so I got very interested in this because it dual boots Android and uh, the, the Linaro distribution of Linux, which uh, we were talking about a few minutes ago. It is a uh, freestanding tablet. You can use it just as a regular tablet. It comes with a very cheesy keyboard here. Uh, $20 add-on, but it's very handy if you want to use it for uh, doing any kind of text processing. 
the Android is uh, flashed inside the machine, but it will take a micro SD card uh, with the Linux distribution on it. Now, Brian mentioned a little uh, while ago that uh, these things are so small that you could lose track of them. Well, this is really small. <laughs> and uh, I have another chip uh, for the uh, stick, which I'm going to show you in a few minutes. And I've uh, misplaced the uh, SD card. I'm going to have to flash into one. The micro SD card? Yeah. Yeah, those are really small. Yeah. This one's a 32 gigabyte, I believe, not four. Uh, the machine has a, a USB port, and so the keyboard will plug right in here. Uh, it's got uh, a port for the SD card. Uh, it has a, looks like a, a USB mini port and an HDMI port. I haven't actually used the HDMI tablet yet, but I think it's capable of 1080p. So, uh, let me move this up. Yeah, you put it under here. Ah, okay. Probably display it, because that's what's space display. I think it may have to be plugged in, too. Share a power uh, connector. Yeah, there's one. Yeah, can you yank out the... Well, he's talking. I'm just going to pass out these things. If you want to be in on the yeah. raffle for the... Yeah, uh, we can yank that out. That's voice. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just write yeah. your name and uh, identifying information and legible. So this um, this machine costs one hundred eighty seven dollars. Do you want that? The uh, keyboard is an additional twenty, and a thirty two uh, gigabyte SD card is a little under thirty dollars. Comes preloaded with the system on it. What's the make of the tablet? Uh, excuse me. What is the make of the tablet? Well, it's a pen pod. Uh, well, you can do the boot up screen shows penpod.com. It's got an all winner A10 machine inside. Um, I think it's a gigabyte of uh, RAM. Um, and I'm not sure how big the flash is for the Android. What's the resolution of the screen? This is, um, I'll come back here. We'll have to look it up on the website. It's, it's something like uh, 1200 by 700, I think. And there's the regular Android main menu. <coughs> shut this down. Three more. <laughs> John, you trying to stack the ballot box? 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he put his on an old eight and a half by eleven. <laughs> <laughs> Did you bring them? No, I'm not easy. Quite a surprise. Well, it should be booty. It's a little tricky to get this card in. Meanwhile, I'll show you this is a stick version of it. <coughs> This is the Peng stick. It has HDMI coming out. Notice the cables. Oh yeah. Which is fairly typical. And uh, has one USB port, which I have hooked up to this, and it has uh, these little RF adapters for the keyboard and mouse. Um, and a power supply and an auto on a, um, uh, uh, OTG uh, USB port, which I don't have hooked up to anything right now. It's a little bit of a mess. Um, it works very nicely. I put it on my equipment rack right next to the TV uh, and plug it in. You can hardly tell it's there. Uh, and uh, it'll do things like play YouTube videos and uh, sort of sort of things you'd like to do. Uh, this machine costs $85. Um, so very similar to the ones that Brian showed. Um, and I've only had these for a week or two, so I can't, I can't really give you too much uh, uh, practical experience of uh, what it is to uh, work with them. But you have you successfully gotten to the, like, a working desktop. Right? Yes. Something of that sort. And I don't know why this didn't boot off the card. Uh, it, it may not be seated properly. So, so actually, people's experience with it not booting off the card is no different than my experience from it not booting off the card. So this is where the, the buyer beware cautionary note comes in, which is that, you know, personally, I don't know. Well, that's why, for one reason, I have two of these devices, right? So I got one figuring I was going to screw it up, and the second one figured that at least that would be kind of a baseline for how it might work in the future. So um, again, because the devices aren't built for particularly the, although the pink pod, arguably, it's at least marketed yes. as, as being specifically for this reason. All the other devices that I'm aware of aren't yet. Uh, all, what is the, the chip? That's an all winner? All winner A10. That's an all winner yeah. A10. And uh, to continue along my, my story, I'm very interested in learning how to do Android, uh, but I want to be able to run Linux, and so having a machine which can do either is ideal for me. Right. And uh, particularly at the low price. And how easy was it to flash the Replicant? Uh, Replicant only runs on four different models of phones. Um, the issue is reverse engineering of the drivers. Um, so Cyanogen Mod works on a lot of other things, and so I may try um, running Cyanogen Mod on uh, this machine. Yeah, that's what I on your phone. Okay, so in the next five minutes we're going to wrap up, and that way we'll beat Jerry's deadline at 9 o'clock. Kurt, if you want to uh, come on up. Thank you, Peter, very much for, sure. for doing that. That was uh, pretty awesome. Um, so here we'll just kind of go through the last few, uh, some disassembly required. Uh, th th there's a lot of disassembly required, to be honest with you, and reassembly in, in some sense. And not the least of it is just working with the, uh, the hardware, but, but also the software. <coughs> well, Kurt and I kind of kicked this idea off, and I don't know if Jerry and John can work this into a, a Linux install fest or something like that, but something to focus on these ARM devices. May 19th is outrageously uh, aggressive, and but it kind of comes, is it the week before Google I.O. or the week after? The week after Google I.O., but the week before the, the big, uh, uh, there's, there's a really big technical conference in Boston that, that week after the 20th. And a few days before the uh, I London think show. Is. Hey, you want to do a dry run on the 15th? What's the 15th? Well, that's uh, the next one's really hard. Next if we could get, you know, if it, well, th the other thing we're trying to do is we, we would, this, this guy, uh, you know, Chairbox, to, to get him here would be a pretty cool thing. Actually, I'll try and 
<coughs> I think what I'll, well, that was sort of the end of the slides anyways. Um, but uh, we'll see, you get, we'll get some audio here. It won't be very loud, I suppose. Well, you can put, if you put VGA in, it's probably. We can do it. All right, maybe yeah. if, you, if you do that. And then, so the first, Jerry maybe can pull out a name. And the first one's from the book. And not because it isn't the, this one, the book is really yeah, I mean, a solid Richard book. Williamson. Richard, right here. Richard Williamson. Good book. It's a, it's a good book. I, t I learned more from just reading the first couple chapters oh, in thank it you. about thank Linux you. than, uh, thank O'Reilly. O'Reilly, uh, <coughs> Then, then uh, yeah, then you know, it's really to have sort of a structured way of understanding the Android space and the Linux space. It goes in its current. <coughs> that's the other thing. It's it's just recently published. Okay, so now the, I did find the missing pieces on the Rico Magic. So for the Rico <coughs> Magic raffle, maybe we can get John to pick this <coughs> one out. Um, so you get both the Rico Magic, and this is where I'm trying to kind of try and instill a little bit of guilt um, on whoever it is that wins this thing eventually. You, I didn't have time to, because it just arrived today, but there are very clear directions, and the people <coughs> who did the early builds of Ubuntu on these devices, they did it with this device, basically with the Rico Magic hardware. So it, in some sense, is the easiest platform to work with when it comes to kind of hacking this stuff, in, short of actually having a ping pong, which is sold as being essentially Linux compatible. This one isn't sold as Linux compatible, but there's a lot of good, you know, Linux vibe in it. Okay, so whoever wins this would love to uh, have you take a crack at it. Anyways, one other thing, they talk about uh, ROMs in the sense that you want you want to describe what a ROM is in this. Well, sense ROM sticks. Uh, is a read-only memory. Uh, it uh, typically gets um, uh, factory programmed, and you may or may not be able to change it. Right. So, so that is the traditional <coughs> definition of what it is. Unfortunately, at least as far as I understand, with the stick people there's been sort of a redefinition of what a ROM is and and what it what to them to, to this sort of um, uh, culture of, of uh, modders it is it's essentially a recompilation of an operating system to have enhanced features or compatibility so it's a software that you load onto one of these devices in, in essence to work like a ROM it, it, I should mention that you can buy the pen hog uh, with the Linux program right into the so you don't need the SD card. SD card. Right, right. So, and, and this is, a, I think, in the Regal Magic uh, folks, you know, I talking to this guy, Andy Kirby, there's potential, you know, if there was a market, and the question is, is there a market for, sufficient market for a larger company to do a Linux, you know, specific or an Ubuntu specific version? Anyways, so the guilt trip is, if you win this, come back May 15th and, uh, and you know, show how you have Ubuntu running on it, okay? <laughs> Uh, but it's batteries included, and you do get that HDMI adapter, <coughs> so you're not going to get stuck out in the... There you go, John. Pick one up. Why'd you come up, John? Oh, so good one. Yeah. Who is this, buddy? Oh, come on. There's just no way. This just doesn't happen. It, would someone please audit these? Um, <laughs> 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 no, he is there a camera? This is, he, 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 didn't, he didn't see it, did he? he had a pencil in his thumb. <laughs> I, think I, think he he I would say he did it honestly. That's I, yeah, well, your years of service. Well, he'll be here in the Kurt. Well, Kurt was the next one out of the hat, so. Um, you know, no, no, no. I think the fix is in. He did pick it. He did pick it. So look, this, these are the kinds of things. There are lots of devices like this that, you know, for, I don't know how much this costs, but it's not that much. But it's got a nice little uh, keypad on it and, and a wireless mouse. And again, it's one of those little devices that, so there's this whole new realm of hardware and, and uh, you know, and software that um, is going to change the way we work and think. Anything else, Kurt? You want any, to, any questions you folks want to ask? Has anybody ever been able to get one of those to work off the car cigarette light? I, I, no problem. Yeah, I'm not. No, the answer is I haven't. But get it off connecting the fuse bar. Get it to work off a what? A car feeder? Like, uh, like a yeah. A what? A cigarette. Uh, uh, Twelve volts. And oh, a I have one complaint about electronics in cars. I think my my the electronics in the car should be actually capable of doing a large enough work to actually pay the monthly bill on the car. Yeah. <laughs> in other words, all cars should be porn servers. 
<laughs> and it should actually pay for the car. Sounds okay. like a sad uh, life skip. Uh, but so I run so on my my on the go devices. You can definitely run it off one of these iPod shuffle things, which I which I think is a lithium. <coughs> if it's a lithium ion battery, then it should only be 3.3 volts, and yet it's USB and it's powering up a panda board, so it's got to be five volts. I'm not really sure. I'm going to bust one of these open. It may just be an inhaler or something that's in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you probably find a switching power supply in there. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. One of the, uh, actually only one of the vendors, but uh, one of the vendors at these Hong Kong shows specifically mentioned, you know, kind of in-car types of applications. So, uh, actually, that's, I, I definitely, I'm interested in that, because once you've got yeah. these little devices, like John just won, you know, it's, you really literally can stick it in a glove compartment box, and if you could stick in a GPS and uh, these other things that work well with Linux, you're off and running to do some interesting things. Anything else? Any other questions? I got a, a bunch of... Next time we get together with Federico, I, I loan stuff to Federico and then I get it back six months later. So, <laughs> so I'll show you my cotton candy. I just wanted to show you the. Um, you remember when we we uh, Brian invited Ravi Khuri from Marvell to come and talk to us once? I don't think he quite talked to us, but he was in town. So he he runs this company called Solid One now. So this is the new Marvell. Pretty much owned all the the plug computers for a while. You had your Guru plug and your Shiba plug. And, Green plug and so so this is the first one with their new architecture. This is it's called the Q box and it also takes one of those micro SD cards which you lose probably about one of those a day <laughs> if you have ten. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I'll be able to report on this. It's an interesting little architecture because it's the Marvell uh, next generation Marvell AVX. AVX <coughs> I know, look at this. What year was that? That was uh, 96. It was 90s, yeah. So, needs an optical drive. That's what we need. Yeah, he was the guy, he was the guy who actually configured all those uh, sheet plugs that we used for the solar panel. He kind of, you know, he, he understands low level stuff. No, he's got his own company. Okay, thank you very much. I just have an idea for another.